We're going to do things a little differently today. Question has been posed to questions have been posed to pastors in general, and I've certainly heard the questions myself. And comments have also been made along the same lines. Questions uh, such as, why are you not as a pastor? Why are you not utilizing this platform, uh, this podium, to be able to speak to the issues at hand in the world around us today? Why are we not doing this? And then the comments are that I have an obligation, that a pastor has an obligation to speak directly to these issues, uh, what's happening in the world around us. Because of these questions, because of these comments, it's, it's in, uh, inspired me to do some, a couple of things that I don't do quite a bit of, I don't do very often at all, as a matter of fact. One of those is to talk about a topic. So that's what I call topical preaching. You, you, you pick a topic and, you know, social injustice would be a great one, right? That's, that's perfect for today. Social injustice. So we pick social injustice and say I'm going to pick a dozen scripture verses to support what I'm saying. The problem is, is in that very statement, they're supporting what I am say, stay, uh, stating, what I have to say. And it's very easy to potentially twist God's word to make it fit what I am trying to say. And so that's why I don't do that a lot. But I'm going to do a little bit of that today. I'm going to talk about what it is as a pastor's responsibility to stand up here before a congregation, to stand up before the people, what responsibility my voice is that I'm supposed to be putting out there to the world. Another thing that I don't, know, I don't normally do, I don't do a lot of at all, is I don't speak directly to situations that are happening in the world. And a big part of the reason is, is, is there anyone here in the sound of my voice that does not know what's happening in the world around us today? Is there anybody here that does not know about the pandemic or the lockdowns or the, the race riots and the, the social injustice that everyone's talking about or, or the politics? Everyone knows about all this stuff. You can't go anywhere or do anything or say anything without hearing about it or seeing it. I was driving down the street and a bus was coming towards me in the opposite direction and they have the little electronic scan up on the top and it shows the destination and it scanned from destination and then it went from that to save a life. I was curious, so I continued to watch it and then it flipped again and it said, wear a mask. You can't get away from it. There are signs everywhere that talk about what's going on around us, that talk about the organizations that are loud and obnoxious and, and uh, at times rude. Um, they talk about all these things. We're, it's, it's everywhere. So do you really want another voice calling out to you and screaming out from the crowd to tell you their own opinion, their own thoughts, and their own understandings? If you want to know what my opinions are on the things that are happening around the world, you want to know how I feel about things, my understanding of things, then go ahead and let's have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But standing up here as a pastor, my job is not to be talking specifically about these topics, not to be addressing specific situations, specific places, specific people, things that are happening in the, in the world around us. That's not what my role is, my responsibility. If you want me to talk about specific things that are happening in the world. Right now, a big thing that's happening is the mandate of masks. And a lot of people are against wearing masks. And if you ask me about it, there's going to be two sides that you're going to hear about. There's going to be two sides of, of me as a person that you're going to hear about. You're going to hear about the compassionate side of me, the side of me that wants to love and care for others and wants to do what's best for everyone else. That side of me that says, yes, uh, I, need to, I need to wear a mask because it's the right thing, even though my own asthma issues, my own health issues, it may cause problems. I say that I need to wear a mask because that's the right thing to do, not for myself, but for other people. And see, my wife, for her, the majority of her heart, the majority of her person is uh, that compassionate side. I'm kind of a 50-50. Half of me is that compassion side. For her, it's the majority of her. And so she feels guilty if she doesn't have a mask on, even if it's at the detriment of her health, to wear one. And so she's guilted into wearing a mask. And, and it, it's not hard to see why you'd be guilted into it when you've got people staring at you and glaring at you and you've got signs that say that you need to save a life and wear a mask. The implication is that you're not wearing a mask, you're a murderer. You're killing people. So she's a little easier to guilt into these things. 
But the other side of me, the side that fights against that, that butts against that compassionate side from time to time, is the very analytical, very detail-oriented, very uh, skeptical, not, not necessarily skeptical, but I like to get to the truth. I like to get to the facts, the real facts. And when I say the facts, I'm not talking about the opinions of politicians that say we need to wear masks. I'm not talking about the opinions of activists that say we need to wear masks. I'm not talking about the opinions of the CDC or the World Health Organization that say we need to wear masks. They're giving an opinion based on their speculation, based on their ideas, their conjecture. But the thing is, you see, that part of me that's very analytical, that part of me goes to the, the organizations, the, the companies that actually test the effectiveness of these materials, in this case, of the masks. One of those, one of those organizations happens to be OSHA. OSHA tests those. If you go on their website, you'll see that the cloth masks that everyone is so prominently wearing those things are uh, generally, they, they say there are some potential benefits, but they say clearly that they are ineffective due to poor fit and poor filtration. Not only that, but they also have the potential, if they are not being properly washed and sanitized every night, they have the potential to actually cause more health problems to the wearer because of the moist environment, the bacteria, the mold, what that, that could build up in it. So, in effect, in basically, in an ineffective procedure, an ineffective tool. How about the paper surgical masks that people are wearing? There's a lot, seeing a lot more of those popping up. Well, those ones, preferably, because they're made for a sterile environment, those should be, and we don't live in a sterile environment, especially if you have kids, those ones should be changed out no less than every 20 minutes. But OSHA's website still says that they are ineffective due to the same reasons as the other ones, it is poor fit and poor filtration. Improper fit and filtration. That's, this is according to OSHA's website. They actually rate these things and actually test them. So they understand better than, than CDC, World Health Organization, certainly better than our politi politicians. And then you have the N95. The N95 is like the holy grail of masks, right? Everyone says, oh, holy, the, the, the N95, that's the one that you need. The N95 is made for a completely contaminated environment. Completely contaminated environment means that everybody would have one of these masks on. Now, we live in a contaminated environment, certainly, but not a completely contaminated environment. And if everybody had one of these N95 masks on, then it may serve its purpose. But if not everybody has an N95, say only half the people have an N95, and the rest of the people have the paper mask and the cloth mask, those cloth masks, the paper mask, and in essence, the N95 masks are all rendered ineffective because they filter what goes in but not what goes out. The other reason that the N95 mask is rated as ineffective against the virus from according to OSHA's website is because of the fact that it is not properly fitted. They are supposed to be fitted to the individual and they are supposed to be trained on how to wear them properly, how to fit them properly, how to clean them properly, how to change out the filtration properly things which the general populace does not do correctly. So all three of these masks are, in essence, ineffective according to the ones who actually rate them and test them and understand them. So you can see, this is what you get. This is a small example of what you would get if I were to talk on these subjects. I could be throwing all kinds of scripture in, in the middle of this, and I could be saying all kinds of wonderful things about God's Word, or from God's Word, but you're still going to, in essence, get my opinions, my thoughts, that are going to come from both sides, this, this budding of heads of the compassionate side with the very logical side. And that's what you're going to get. And that's not what you want. That's not what you deserve. And that's not what I was called to do. So no, I don't speak on topics. And I do not speak on specific situations that are happening in the world around me. So then the logical conclusion is that I'm ignoring What's going on around me? That I'm sticking my head in the sand like the cartoon ostrich and acting like this? none of this is happening? doesn't exist? That's the logical conclusion, right? That's, that's what people might think. You see, my understanding is, as a pastor, as a Christian, let's go back to being a Christian. As a Christian, my understanding of, of my responsibility is that I am to spread the good news. I'm to spread the gospel, the coming kingdom of God. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 tells us to go out into the world, into all the world and make disciples. 
Okay? Jesus tells his disciples this, and, and by extension, all Christians. This is our responsibility as a Christian. And as I became a pastor, when I came to God through Jesus and the waters of baptism, I took that responsibility very seriously. It became a commitment for me. And when I became a pastor, that commitment became even more ingrained into who I am. My responsibility, my duty to my God is to do what he commanded through his son Jesus, and that is to go and tell the world about the coming kingdom, to tell them about salvation through Jesus, to tell them the good news that is contained within God's word. That's my responsibility. Jesus did the exact same thing during his ministry. Jesus lived in a time that is very similar to our own, in many ways much worse than our own. We talk about social injustice. Man, they had social injustice far worse than what we are dealing with, What the perception of what we're dealing with. You want to talk about racism. Racism was far worse, and slavery were far worse during Jesus' time in Israel and around Rome than anything we've been experiencing or the perception of what we're experiencing. There are so many things that were happening during his time. Diseases and Hatred and violence, corrupt governments, this was all going on. Everything that we are experiencing or we perceive to be experiencing was happening in Jesus' day. And in many cases, it was amplified far worse than what is actually happening today in our lives. And the people, the people, when they heard the Messiah would come, they're thinking, thank you, God. Because this is the king that is going to overthrow Rome, that is going to free Israel. We are going to be free. We are no longer going to have this oppression. We are no longer going to be slaves. We are no longer going to be held down. We are going to be free. We are going to rule. We are going to have you as our God, and he will be our king. Thank you. But that's not the type of king that Jesus was. Their expectation was that he was going to overthrow, that he was going to kick Rome right out of Israel. That wasn't his purpose there. And there were a lot of people that were very disappointed. It's one of the driving factors for why Judas betrayed Jesus to begin with. His expectation was of this king, this powerhouse that was going to remove Rome from the picture. And he was disappointed. And so the devil's work that he had been doing within Judas really just came to the boil, came to a head. And he betrayed Jesus. Now there are many people that brought up to Jesus all the things that were happening, everything that was going on around him, all the struggles that they had. And Jesus touched on each of those as an aside. But Jesus' focus from the start of his ministry to the end of his ministry, was the coming kingdom of God. He spoke about the Old Testament prophecies that were being fulfilled through him, and all of it ultimately pointing to the coming kingdom of God, to the salvation that we would have through the ultimate sacrifice that God was providing in his son Jesus. This is what Jesus' focus was the whole time. This was his ministry. As a Christian, this is our ministry to speak the good news, the coming kingdom of God, to speak of salvation through Jesus Christ and the waters of baptism as we come to God, that redemption that is available for us, that eternal life that has been offered to us. This is our purpose. This is what God wants us to do. He calls us to do when we come to him. That's what our call is. Jesus showed us this. So that's what I do. I speak about God's word. I help each of us, I hope that I help each of us to understand better what God has to say, what his word has for us in our lives. Now that does not mean that I am not touching on the subjects that are happening in the world around us today. Slavery, the, the whole implication that this country was built upon slavery. It's ludicrous, but I'm going to tell you something. 
And I don't know how many times I've said this in the past, but there, the Bible mentions slavery in two distinct ways. One was the horrible forced labor that was abolished, was overthrown hundreds of years ago in our country. Yes, it was a part of our country, but it was overthrown. And there are people, the Bible says that this type of slavery was bad. I agree. Most logical people would agree that this is bad. As a matter of fact, I would say that 99.5% of the entire population in the U.S. would probably agree that that type of slavery, forced labor like that, is bad. They would not support it. They would not condone it. They would fight against it. They would fight to overthrow it, to tear it down. Now, I didn't say everybody. I said 99.5% because there is a percentage of people. There is a small amount of people in this world who have been so consumed by evil and by Satan that they don't care. There are evil people out there that would love slavery to be a part of, of, of a, would love for slavery to be a thing. Because they want to rule over people. They want to inflict pain upon people. They want to inflict their will upon people. And I can tell you one thing. Here's, here's the thing. We talk about slavery and you automatically think color. But for those people, for that small percentage of people who would be supportive of slavery, they really don't care the color of the person that they are subjecting to their will. And I can tell you this because there is slavery that is happening. That type of slavery, people subjecting others to their will, and it generally happens within a marriage. That's the worst part of it. They don't care what color the person is. Because evil does not care about color. Evil does not care whether you are black or white or yellow or brown or red. It does not care. It simply wants to destroy and subject you. And that is not the majority of people. And I mentioned there are two types of slavery. The other type of slavery is rampant throughout the United States. As a matter of fact, it's pretty rampant throughout the entire world, uh, and it's highly encouraged. See, in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, talked about people who were not self-sufficient. They were not self-sufficient. They could not provide for themselves and their family based off of what they were producing alone. They could not produce enough to be able to sell it on their own and provide for their family. And so in those cases, the people would go to someone who was very wealthy, who was very affluent, and they would serve them. They would utilize their skills, their talents, their abilities for that person's benefit. And that person would, in turn, give them a wage. I'm talking about a job, people. I'm talking about going to work, having a career. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Our English translations place both of these types of slavery as the same word, slaves or slavery. But they're two distinct different things. So I have been talking about this because I've mentioned that many times. How slavery, the forced slavery, is bad. And that there is a distinction of another type of slavery. Voluntary servitude. Working. I don't talk enough about social injustice, right? I don't talk enough about how people are treating one another. I have been talking till I'm blue in my face about the purpose, the reason God created us, that he put us on this earth, that he knit us in our, in our mother's wombs. We are here to be in relationship with God and with one another. And the very foundation, the core, the very heart of those relationships is love. I don't know how many times I've said that it doesn't matter what someone looks like, where they come from. Love them. Love your neighbor. I've said numerous times, love your enemy. Just as scripture tells us. But they, they look different than me. Everybody, unless you're an identical twin, everybody looks different than you. Get over it. Love them. Uh, 
they get a different skin color. That's melanin. Everybody has it unless you're an albino. Just different quantities. Who cares? Get over it. Love them. Jesus was a different color, most likely, than most of us. I don't think anybody, uh, I don't think science has proven that anybody has the exact same melatonin levels, or melanin levels. I don't think anybody does. So we're all different in that level. Who cares? Get over it. Love one another. I mean, speak a different language than I do. Jesus spoke a couple different languages, and I don't think any of them were English. They dressed differently. Jesus wore robes. When's the last time you wore a robe out in public? Nah, you know what? Don't answer that. Maybe I don't want to know. The point is, it doesn't matter. All these little things don't matter. We're told to love God, and we're told to love one another. It doesn't mean we're permissive, and we allow bad behaviors, and we condone bad behaviors, things that are clearly against God and against God's word. But we still love the people. That's what we're told to do. I speak about this, so you can you can look at you can look at what these what these sermons are, and you can say, "Well, I haven't heard him once mention this person or that situation or or this city. What's going on here? I haven't once heard him talking about these things. I haven't once heard him mention the word racism in any of his sermons. I haven't heard it. I haven't seen it." I haven't heard him say anything about social injustice. I haven't heard those words come out of his mouth. Yeah, you're right. The words haven't come out of my mouth in a sermon. Doesn't mean I haven't spoken about it. Like I said, when Jesus, when the people came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, this is what's happening to us in our world. This is what's happening. Are you going to do these things? Are you going to overthrow this government? He would mention, he would he'd kind of mention what they were asking about as an aside. But again, the focus was on God's word in the coming kingdom. Doesn't mean he was ignoring the situations. He was not implicit with his silence. Complicit with his silence, excuse me. He was not complicit with his silence. I am not complicit with my silence because I'm not silent. I'm not ignoring the situations that are going on. But I'm trying to tell you the truth of God's word so that we can understand, so that we can know what it is that we should be doing. If we were to live God's word, just these simple little things, just love God and love one another. If we could follow just those two simple things, we wouldn't be dealing with the situations we're in right now. We wouldn't be having the struggles we're having right now. None of this would even matter. You think I'm not touching on these subjects. You think I'm not touching on what's going on in the world today. Then you have neither ears to hear or eyes to see. The only solution is to start listening and start reading. Start understanding God's word and the truth that's there and the truth that I try and present. These aren't my words, folks. You don't want my opinions. You don't want my thoughts, my understandings. You might. Those who don't want to do it for themselves, they want someone else's thoughts. They want someone else's opinions. You don't need my thoughts. You do not need my opinions, my understandings. What you need is truth the real truth that God's word presents. And that's what I try to give to you each and every week. And just because I'm not mentioning specific names or places or situations, please do not misconstrue the fact that I am talking about what is going on in the world and in today, what is going on in our lives. Open your eyes. See what's happening. Listen to God's word and make it a part of your life. And you'll begin to understand just how focused we can become when our focus is on God's word and the coming kingdom.
pray for each of you. I pray for this country, for our world, for our society. I pray that God blesses each of you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that in every situation, in every moment of our lives that we are focused upon you, that we are focused upon the truth in your word, and that we can grow closer to you through that relationship as we develop, that we can have our ears opened to hear the truth, that we can have our eyes opened to see the truth and to learn and to grow. And that in everything, that we draw closer to you through your son, Jesus, and that we would finally understand what it is to truly love one another. Lord, give us strength. Help us to endure these times. In Jesus' name, amen.